One of the major complications of human reproduction is the difficulty of childbirth, which has led many women to, un to ask why evolution didn't design them with a zipper rather than with what the, the apparatus that they've got. There's an interesting connection here, and it shows uh, the strong impact of a historical evolutionary constraint on a subsequent important adaptation. Upright posture has greatly changed childbirth. It's difficult because the pelvis has been modified for bipedalism. Maternal mortality has only recently declined in developed countries. It remains high in undeveloped countries, so there has been a cost imposed by bipedalism for a long time. And in fact, modern medicine has not yet completely rescued us from, from this cost. The female pelvis constrains brain size at birth. Uh, not only are human babies born with large heads, they ought to be born with even larger heads. And the fact that they have a prolonged period of development after birth to achieve adult brain size essentially has created that part of the human life cycle we call childhood. So childhood is an indirect knock-on consequence of this. The infant head has to rotate through the birth canal in humans, but it can exit directly in chimpanzees. This creates issues because this is one of the things that causes umbilical cords to get tangled around the necks of infants and cause, causes problems in human birth that don't exist in other species. Most human infants are born facing backward, whether, whereas in other primates they are born facing forward, and this increases the human need to have help at birth. So humans need midwives for several reasons, this being one of them, and chimpanzees do not. So it looks like there have been a long series of consequences of the fact that about seven million years ago, we stopped moving on four limbs and stood up and started running on two legs. Childbirth is quite risky. And this shows that maternal mortality has only recently declined. So the period covered here is from 1890 up to 1950. The y-axis is maternal mortality rate. And what you can see is that in Sweden, England, and Wales, and the United States, starting in about 1935, mort mortality rates declined. At this point, mortality rates are about 0.1% of birth. So maternal mortality is still about one in a thousand during childbirth from 1950 on in the United States. Much of this decline is due to hygiene and antibiotics. So the causes of maternal death can be a number of things, but one of them is puerperal fever. Puerperal fever is a bacterial infection of the female reproductive tract that is due to bacteria that get in during delivery. And with the development of sulfonamides and with penicillin, deaths through puerperal fever fell off quite a bit. It's interesting that it was still a major cause of maternal death up through about 1935. There are still problems in childbirth in, de in developing countries. So this is the global distribution of maternal death in childbirth. The green countries are the best, the red countries are the worst. You'll notice that Australia, Japan, and the European countries, and Canada do better than the United States. That's because the United States has many people without health insurance and many people living in poverty. You can see that the rate of deaths in terms of deaths per million births is still about 1,000 deaths per million births in places like the Central African Republic and uh, so forth in Central Africa and in Somalia where healthcare is really quite poor and many people are only making $100 a year. So death in childbirth is still a global problem. The difficulties of childbirth result from bipedalism and increased brain size. So you can see here in light blue the pelvis of a chimpanzee and the pelvis of a human. You can see that the chimpanzee pelvis relative to its body size is really much bigger and it has a different shape. The human pelvis has been modified to form a sort of a basket to support the internal organs as we stand standing so that there wouldn't be a hernia and we would 
lose internal organs getting expressed outside of the body. So the bones are there to make sure that the weight of our organs doesn't cause a catastrophic failure. And that change has occurred in approximately five million years. If we look at the sequence in which things happen, it was really rather interesting. We notice that bipedalism, which probably started with Sahel Anthropus about six million years ago, long preceded the narrow birth canal, which came in with Homo habilis about two million years ago. So there's about a five million year lag there between bipedalism and the narrow birth canal. During this time, our ancestors got better and better and better at walking on two legs. And by the time we got into the genus Homo, with Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo sapiens, we probably had evolved into hairless, long-distance runners who were capable of running down antelope, things like that, in the savanna. And because that was becoming a major form of food acquisition, it became very important that we were good at running upright. That meant that the pelvis got remodeled, and that led to the problems in childbirth. So the sequence was Sahelanthropus, bipedal, about seven million years ago. Australopithecus, whom we'll meet again in a minute, was bipedal, small-brained, probably ate fruit. The narrow birth canal came in with Homo habilis, who had fire and tools, about two million years ago. And if we look at what was happening in this sequence to the infant cranium, we can see that in monkeys, such as Atellus and Nasalis, the cranium is actually quite a bit smaller than the birth canal. So the outer ring here is the birth canal and the black is the cranium. In macaques, it's just about the size of the birth canal. In gibbons, the cranium is smaller than the birth canal. But look at our closest relatives here. Pongo is the orangutan, Pan is the chimpanzee, and of course gorilla is the gorilla. And they all give birth to infants that have much smaller crania than their birth canals, so birth is relatively easy. But look at the way the human cranium completely fills the human birth canal. If we take another look at this, what we're now doing is we're looking more or less the way that an obstetrician would look, face on into the pelvis as the baby is being born. This is how in the chimpanzee, Pan, the uh, cranium enters the birth canal, okay? And in entering it, in the middle of it, and in coming out of it, it can sit all in the same plane. This is Australopithecus, and Austra in Australopithecus, the infant has to rotate its cranium, or the mother and the infant together have to rotate the infant's cranium 90 degrees to get it into the birth canal, and then it rotates further and comes out sideways. In Homo, it rotates, it enters the birth canal, as in Australopithecus, sideways, and then it rotates vertical in order to come out. So this is the kind of complicated action that can also lead to problems during childbirth. That rotation is what causes humans to be born facing backwards. Okay? In most primates, they come out facing forwards. A monkey mother who is giving birth here can just reach down and catch her newborn child with one hand and bring it up, clean any matter out of its passages and help it to breathe. A human mother has a harder time. Her baby is coming out going away from her. So it's possible for a mother to give birth on her own and it certainly does happen, but the difficulties that result in that situation are greater than if there was a midwife or another helper there who can catch the baby because then it can, that, that person can immediately help to clean out the air passages. So that is one major difference, which is basically caused by upright posture and having a large cranium. Now, it's interesting that although humans have a large cranium at birth, it's actually relatively small to how big it is when they're grown up an adult. What you see here is the postnatal brain growth index is a function of neonatal brain size. So this is how much the brain will grow as a function of how big it is relative to the mother's body. 
and you can see that humans really stand out on this. What that basically means is that after the baby is born, its brain, human brains then grow a lot more than do chimpanzee brains. This would be a chimpanzee brain over here. This would be another monkey over here. That would be a gibbon there, okay? So there is a long period of brain growth after birth in humans, and we call this period childhood. It ranges from birth up to about seven years. So to summarize, when we started walking upright, that remodeled the pelvis in a way that constrained size at birth, primarily the size of the cranium and thus of the brain. Selection was there to increase infant size at birth, but it was balanced by the selection operating through maternal mortality and childbirth. So there's a trade-off between the health of the infant and the health of the mother. Morphological constraints have contributed to this evolution of the uniquely long human childhood during which the brain then grows up to adult size.